I'm Judith Krenzig, and before I show you a short extract from one of my history presentations, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself and what I can offer as a cruise ship speaker. As a crime novelist, I've been giving talks and presentations to large audiences, including at national writing conferences, for more years than I care to remember. And as I hope to demonstrate, I'm an experienced cruise ship lecturer. I have three passions in life, travel, history, and writing. I've traveled extensively, both on cruise ships as a passenger and a speaker, and on land tours throughout all five continents, East and West Europe, Asia, including Central Asia, Indochina and India, all over Africa and the Americas. Though my first degree is in geography, I've had a lifelong interest in history, especially that of the ancient world. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm a writer, a prize winning crime novelist, currently writing my 17th book, Peril in Persia. I'm able to combine all three of those passions in my books. My novels include travel mysteries, which take place on a holiday tour. Each one is based on itineraries that I've personally done. After all, what better excuse can there be for a holiday than essential research, especially to exotic places like Morocco, Uzbekistan, Japan, Persia and the Galapagos. Though I confess I've been to far more places than I'll ever have time to write the novels. I'm an experienced creative writing tutor and have taught courses for my local further education college, the WEA, that's the Workers' Education Association, and a great many other organisations, and was for many years part of the University of Bath's programme. I began working on ships back in 2014 on a Marco Polo cruise to the Canaries, giving writing workshops. Since then, I've led workshops on several cruise lines, including Swan Alenic, Saga, Fred Olsen and Princess, and most re recently as the writer in residence on board Viking Orion. As with all my talks, even my writing workshops are put together with a location in mind. This slide is from a workshop I gave after we'd visited a market in Oman on a Viking Orion cruise travelling from Athens through the Suez Canal all the way to India. I've also been asked to talk about my life as a novelist, aspects of writing and the literature and great writers associated with the countries we're visiting on the cruise. Back in 2015, I did a port lecturing course, and my first cruise was for voyages of discovery to Central America, sailing from Cartagena in Colombia, along the southern shores of each of the countries of Central America, to Acapulco in Mexico. And this included my first bridge tour, as we travelled through the Panama Canal, from where, I have to say, I had the best view of anyone on the ship going through the locks. Since then, I've had the privilege of being asked to do a great many port and destination talks throughout the Mediterranean, the Atlantic coast of Northern Europe and the Baltic, with various cruise lines, including around the British Isles on the Fred Olsen cruise, and in 2019, through the Baltic on Celebrity Silhouette. As you can see from this slide, many of my enrichment talks have been on history. Now the trouble with history, as we all know, is that it is written by the victors. That well-known phrase, even quoted by Winston Churchill when he was writing his four-volumed A History of English-Speaking Peoples. And it has ever been thus from the very first historians, Homer and Herodotus, which of course is why the poor old Trojans and my beloved Persians come off so badly. 
which is why you should always look very carefully at your sources and their prejudices. So before I begin my presentation on the Norman Conquest, I should point out that I am Anglo-Saxon British. One of the best examples of the Victor story is pictured on the Bayeux Tapestry. It is the quintessential piece of political propaganda. William was one of the best spin doctors there has ever been. William claimed that before he died, Edward the Confessor, the much loved King of England, had promised to make William his successor and that after Edward's death, Harold Godwinson had seized William's rightful throne. William managed to persuade the whole of Europe, including the Pope himself, that he was the rightful heir. Mind you, Alexander II had his own reasons for wanting William to be successful. On his succession, Alexander had gone about stamping out the lax ways of the clergy, increasing his control over the church. But Alexander's reforms had had very little impact on the English church at the fringes of Europe. So Alexander saw this as an opportunity to stamp his authority on what he saw as a rebel sector which paid only lip service to his leadership. So William set sail with Alexander's blessing. And on the tapestry, you can see the Pope's banner a symbol of his support, an attempt to convince everyone who saw the tapestry that William had God on his side. The tapestry shows the death of King Edward. At the foot of the bed is Queen Edith. Strigand, the Archbishop of Canterbury, stands in the background. Now the story that William and his followers put out is that Harold leans down to hear the king's last whispered words, which were that he wants Harold, not William, to be the next king. Now, according to William, Harold must have been lying because Edward was already dead. Now, is that really a credible story? Let's look at the facts. Edward had ruled England for 42 years, but when he died in January 1066, not only did he have no sons, he had no blood relative to reign after him. Edward had to choose someone to succeed him. According to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, he nominated his brother-in-law and right-hand man, Harold, Earl of Wessex the most senior earl in the country. When Edward the Confessor died, Harold was duly elected King of England, as was the custom by the assembly of leading Saxon noblemen known as the Witten Age Mot, two days later. Harold was the eldest son of Godwin of Wessex, and he was the most powerful nobleman in England. Harold, as Dux Angolorum, was the Duke of the English. And he'd proved himself on the battlefield as well as an able administrator. William was Dux Normanorum, Duke of the Normans, a much smaller province. So William was only a very minor Duke. The Duchy of Normandy was only a century old, a creation of William's grandfather, a Viking, Rollo. He had been given this part of northern France by the French king in return for stopping the Viking raids and on condition that he and his men convert to Christianity. William himself was illegitimate, the son of an embalmer's daughter and Duke Robert, known even in his own day as William the Bastard. Edward was an old man and had been ill for some time. Would he have left it to his deathbed before announcing his heir? Even if he hadn't already made a decision, his council, the senior barons and the leading bishops, who were at that time part of the political elite, they would surely have urged him to do so. 
If Edward had promised the throne to William, as William claimed as far back as 1051, why didn't Edward inform his council? Surely his council would have known. Now this is not the agnostic 21st century. We're barely out of the 900s, a society deeply rooted in religion at every level. Edward was regarded as a saint. You can see his halo in the picture. It's why he was given the title of confessor. Would his council, including Archbishop Strigand, go against the wishes of a holy man and bring the wrath of God upon themselves by supporting Harold's claim if Edward had not proposed Harold in the first place? In 1066, England was the wealthiest and most efficiently run state in Europe. And William wasn't the only one who wanted to get his hands on it. Harold Hadrada, meaning Harold the Ruthless, the last Viking king of Norway, was one of the foremost warriors of his age. And he saw the opportunity and decided to claim the English throne. All summer, King Harold waited with his troops on the south coast for the attack. But William's ships were grounded by unfavourable winds. And when autumn arrived, and there was still no sign, Harold decided that William wouldn't risk the crossing. The winds would be too strong and the seas too rough at that time of year. So he returned to London. He ordered the English fleet that had been waiting at the Isle of Wight to do the same. In early September, Hadrada brought a fleet of 300 ships up the Humber. And with King Harold in the south, he won an easy battle in York and set up camp, believing that he had won the north. Now threatened on both sides, King Harold was faced with a dilemma. Was it possible to march north and defeat the Norwegians and return in time to meet the Normans when they arrived? Harold decided to march his troops north on September the 25th, and he surprised the Norwegians in a decisive battle at Stamford Bridge in which Harold Hadrada was killed. From that point on, luck was against Harold. The wind direction in the English Channel changed, enabling the Normans to set sail from Dives in Normandy to saint Valery, and on to land at Pevensey on September the 28th. With Harold in the north and the English fleet now in London, William landed unopposed. Now Harold and his mounted troops came south in less than 13 days to London, then on to Hastings, scraping together what infantry they could, hoping to surprise William. This he did by assembling his troops as a wall of shields at the top of a hill flanked by marshy streams, not far from Hastings where William had set up camp. The fighting tactics between the two armies was very different. The Norman troops were mounted, supported by archers. Only the Saxon barons had horses, and the bulk of the fighting men were infantry, who formed this shield wall. Now, unless the wall gave way, they were a match for the cavalry. These long spears could be thrust from beneath the shield into the legs of the horses, unseating the men, who were then, of course, very vulnerable. The battle raged on for most of the day. Every attack the Normans made was repulsed. Late in the day, a rumour spread through the troops that William had fallen from his horse. Believing that they had now won, the shield wall broke as the Saxon troops rushed down the hill. A 
and we all know the outcome. The story goes that Harold died from an arrow in his eye, as you can see on the left of the picture. We now know that that arrow is a much later addition to the tapestry, possibly part of a repair. And there are two explanations as to why this might have happened. We know that Harald Hardrada, the King of Norway, was killed by an arrow in the neck. So perhaps whoever repaired it, which is presumably back in Normandy, mixed up the two Haralds. Although it could have been an attempt to sort of twist the story somewhat because it was a common held belief back in those days that if you died by an arrow in the eye it was a sign that you were a perjurer. Now the truth is that of course he was cut down by a Norman knight and that's what you can see on the right hand side of the picture. His body was in fact so badly hacked about that William refused to hand it over after the battle to the Saxons for burial. So we have no real idea of where Harold was buried. After the battle, life for the Anglo-Saxons became pretty grim. The conquest resulted in fundamental changes. William began by virtually eliminating the existing governing class, transferring ownerships of their estates to his followers, especially the Normans. It wasn't only the English barons who were dispossessed. The English church was also cleansed. English bishops and senior clergy were all replaced by ones from Normandy. Archbishop Stigand was immediately replaced as Archbishop of Canterbury by the Norman Langfranc. And William imposed not only a new aristocracy, he imposed a whole new way of governance upon the people introducing new justice and tax systems, not just in England, but eventually in Scotland, Wales and Ireland. Not surprisingly, the British nobles and people didn't take this lying down and the country was awash with rebels. The Saxons set up secret ambushes for the Normans in woods and remote places. And William and his barons had to be protected by armed guards wherever they went. So William introduced a new penalty, the Murderum Fine. It forced the Anglo-Saxon villagers to prove that any corpse found near their village was not a Norman. A pretty tall order if you think about it. And if they couldn't, the whole village had to pay a hefty fine. He also introduced the forest laws. Trees could not be cut down for burning and his, the people who lived in the forests couldn't own their own dogs or bows and arrows. And the punishment for hunting the king's deer was to be blinded. For the first four years of his reign, William faced constant rebellion, which he rigorously put down. Much of that rebellion came from the north, and in 1069, William marched to York, adopting a scorched earth policy, killing every man, woman and child, burning houses and crops. Cities were sacked, monasteries pillaged, churches burnt down, and the land laid waste. The north was given over to a reign of terror, and what was known as the harrowing of the north and 150,000 people were killed in three months. It took generations to recover. To demonstrate their power, the Normans began a massive building programme. The hastily constructed wooden castles, built when they first arrived, were replaced with massive stone structures all over England. The first was the White Tower, in the Tower of London, and then they quickly extended from the southeast. Then, to subdue the rebellious north. Later, 
as William extended his power into Wales, castles were built all across the north coast to Carnarvon and along the southern coast to Pembroke. The king needed 5,000 knights to man these castles, which is what led to the emergence of the feudal system of the early Middle Ages. William kept the promises he had made to his 170 followers who had fought with him and gave them English land. And in exchange, the barons had to be loyal to William and to provide knights for him whenever he needed them. In their turn, the barons granted land to their followers and these, the knights, promised to be loyal to the barons, to fight for them when needed and to raise money when the barons demanded it. And at the very bottom of the pile were the peasants. They had to work the land for the knights at certain times of the year and to pay the knights in produce which kept the knights' families and their retainers supplied with food. So every person owed his or her living to the lord of the manor, who allowed them their small pocket of land and who had to be paid either in service or money or in goods. I hope that has given you an idea of the scope of what I can offer and of my presentation style. Thank you so much for your time.